Good morning. Thank you for joining us. This presentation is being recorded. My name is Cynthia Ather, and I will be your moderator for the day. Today, we will discuss what the new street food vending law means to you, the sidewalk food vendors. Sara Shakir from the Community and Industry Engagement Program at Environmental Health will be our presenter today. Our leadership team in the Environmental Health Division will be joining the conversation to answer some questions. With us, we have the Environmental Health Director, Lisa Frias, and the Specialized Surveillance and Enforcement Branch Director, James Dragan. Welcome. Next, let's go over a couple of housekeeping items. If you need translation, please click on the ellipses, the three dots under the slides on your screen, and you will see translate slides. If you move your mouse over that, you will see 19 available languages to translate your slides into. Click the language you prefer, and after a quick processing, all your slides will be translated. Please take advantage of this resource if it helps. We will host another webinar in Spanish in two weeks and will provide more details at the end. Today's presentation runs about 90 minutes long. We will take your questions along the way and at the end. To ask questions, please type them in on the chat box or raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon at the top of your screen so we can enable your mic. Again, we will pause along the way to give you some answers and take the rest of the questions at the end. We will also have a five minute break halfway through the presentation. With all that being said, let's jump into the presentation. Sara Shakir, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Again, my name is Sara Shakir and I'll be your presenter today. Uh, many of us have heard about Senate Bill 972, the new street food vending law. So this webinar is for you, those uh, interested in uh, sidewalk food vending and sidewalk food vendors. So let's take a look at our agenda for today. Again, the presentation is about 90 minutes long. Uh, we'll take questions along the way. We'll have a break, a five minute break about halfway through. So. Today, uh, we're going to cover a quick summary of SB 972, which became effective on January 1st, 2023. Uh, in, it will be followed by an explanation of the permitting process. So we'll review the process of choosing a menu and a card to getting a card to finalizing the process and getting a public health permit under the new law changes. Then we'll discuss the proposed fees that will be submitted to the Board of Supervisors for approval on May 23rd uh, um, this year. And uh, we'll talk about processing times, workshops, and available resources. And we'll end by answering as many questions as time allows. And for questions that we do not get to answer, we'll provide written responses on our website on the Frequently Asked Questions section. We can also follow up individually as needed, and we'll provide more information about this at the end of the presentation. So a little bit of history. In 2018, sidewalk vending was decriminalized in California by the passage of Senate Bill 946. However, SB 946 didn't address sidewalk food vending requirements in the California Retail Food Code. As a result, many food vendors were still unable to obtain the necessary permits. So SB 972, uh, which again became effective January 1st this year, provides a new chapter in the California Retail Food Code. Uh, that's the top box on your right. And this new chapter addresses specifically sidewalk food vending operations. Um, the chapter is 11.7, and it's specifically called Compact Mobile Food Operations. Uh, the new law also modifies uh, the definition of limited food preparation, and we'll go into detail uh, about, about all of this in a couple, you know, throughout the presentation. Um, the new bill also reduces requirements, uh, operational and structural, for CMFOs, or Compact Mobile Food Operations. It provides new commissary options 
and it expands uh, operations for cottage food um, and uh, micro enterprise home kitchens. Uh, we don't have micro enterprise home kitchen operations approved in Los Angeles County, so we won't be covering uh, that topic in this presentation. And also we, be, we will be hosting separate trainings uh, to discuss the expansions of cottage food operations. So please uh, make sure you subscribe to our email list so we let you know when those presentations happen. And we'll provide all those details for contacting us at the end of this presentation. So what is a compact mobile food operation? How is it defined under the new law? So a compact mobile food operation, it's a type of mobile food facility that operates from a stand, a showcase, a rack, a display that offers prepackaged, non-potentially hazardous foods, things like prepackaged uh, chips, nuts, bottle drinks, or whole produce. It can also be a push cart, a pedal driven cart, a wagon, or other non motorized conveyance that is approved for the sale of prepackaged, potentially hazardous foods or per perishables. And it can also conduct limited food preparation. So, the structural and operational requirements that must be met uh, by the CMFOs are. Uh, all the ones that are included in Chapter 10 of the California Retail Food Code, which is the chapter for mobile food facilities. But except uh, with the ex exception of those uh, detailed on the new chapter for compact mobile food operations. So we're going to go through all of these throughout the presentation, but this is just kind of like a summary. Uh, CMFOs are also required to operate in conjunction with a commissary, a mobile support unit, or other facility approved by us, the enforcement agency. There is also an exemption for some facilities that uh, have a food display of less than 25 square feet and sell only prepackaged, non-perishable uh, foods or whole uncut produce. And again, we'll provide more details and we have some guidelines for you also we'll be providing on the chat. So uh, this table gives us a summary of the, the basic requirements for CMFOs that have food preparation. In other words, that they have uh, open food and they are doing something with it. Uh, on the first column, you see all the requirements. On the second and third column, you're going to see uh, the requirements for food preparation and the, the difference between these two columns is that the second column is only for uh, preparation that does not include uh, raw meats, raw poultry, or raw fish. So in this case, these uh, facilities don't need to provide for necessarily a wear washing sink and a water heater. The Last column is uh, for uh, CMFOs that are conducting uh, or handling raw meats, raw poultry, and raw fish, and these uh, have to fulfill all the requirements listed on the first column, which are, and we're going to go on, you know, more detail about these, but it's plant check, hand washing, saying, wear washing sink, water heater, mechanical refrigeration, have holding equipment, and a commissary. So, what what can or or what are the options for the facilities that are, are not handling raw meats, raw poultry, or raw fish for the wear washing sink? So instead of having to have a wear washing sink on the cart, they have two options. One of the options is to have uh, spare utensils. So the spare utensils they can be provided in lieu of the wear washing sink as long as the facility doesn't handle raw meats, raw poultry, or raw fish. And they can provide separate, uh, you know, spare utensils and they need to be, to make sure that they are separated from the dirty utensils. Uh, and uh, that's one of the options. Then the second option is auxiliary units. These are units that are not part of the, the uh, CMFO, the food cart but they can um, operate and service up to four carts. And it could be a wear washing sink, 
or a hand washing sink or both. The main uh, requirement for this option is that it has to be location specific. So in other words, if you get a permit uh, to set up these auxiliary units on a park, you have to remain at that park at that location uh, for a permit that you will be uh, receiving to operate these auxiliary units. Uh, and the requirements for that would be that you submit a plan, some, some sort of a map that delineates where these are going to be located, how things are going to be set up, and you're going to need a public health permit for that. And again, no more than four cards you can service. For that, you would still need to check with your local city and see if they allow this or they have any uh, provisions uh, regarding this particular setup. OK, so before I continue, I'm going to go over now on how you can get a permit under these new regulations. I don't see any questions on the chat, so I just want to remind you that I'm going to be stopping along the way to answer any questions you may have. You can also raise your hand. So since I didn't see any questions, I'm going to continue. Uh, but please know that we will take questions uh, throughout the presentation. So how are these changes incorporated on the permitting process? How can you get a permit? So uh, we have identified seven steps uh, for the process of getting a CMFO permit or a food cart. And uh, the first step that you need to consider is what type of food you want to sell. Then you want to decide what type of uh, conveyance, non-motorized conveyance, will support, will be able to support that uh, type of menu, then you want to know what is structural and operational requirements apply for that particular conveyance. If you need written operational procedures, what type of commissary you would need. And then finally, with the process, once you know all of these, then you know what type of card you need and how to get it through the process of the uh, card permit and then uh, be able to apply for a public health permit. So we're going to go into these uh, in the next few slides. Again, if you have any questions, please type them on the chat or raise your hand. And from the permitting process uh, point of view or perspective, the easiest um, type of food that you can get a permit for is the non-perishable prepackaged food. And uh, as you see, there is four categories that we have uh, kind of identify for uh, permits, different types of uh, permits and um, foods that can be prepared on a cart. So prepackaged non-perishable foods, prepackaged uh, potentially hazardous foods, limited food preparation. We're going to go over that definition so we are clear on what it entails. That the third and fourth bullet include limited food preparation, but they, uh, they defer uh, from including raw meats uh, on the on the fourth bullet, but not on the third one. So a key a key uh, definition to keep in mind is going to be limited food preparation, and we're going to go over that. So this is a definition that was modified with SB 972, and um, I'm going to go over this. Um, that uh, so all the the items so so the definition includes nine categories of uh, food preparation activities. Uh, four of those nine are new or modified, and all the the ones in white lettering um, are existing. So number one, it's something that a lot of uh, food carts have already been doing, uh, which is heating, frying, baking, roasting, popping, shaving of ice, blending steaming or boiling of hot dogs or assembling of non prepackaged food. Of course, all of this depends on the infrastructure that is the um, equipment that is part of the cart, right? And uh, three and four apply mostly for uh, catering um, operations and satellite food operations. So not much applicable to what we're talking about today. But number two is, and it's a new allowance under SB 972, and it, it is about dispensing and portioning of food that is non-potentially hazardous. 
hazardous, like uh, chips, you know, if you are preparing chips or something like that, or also dispensing and portioning for immediate service. That is, a, you have a customer in front of you and you are going to dispense and portion uh, food that has been under temperature control um, up to the point that you are before you are going to serve it. So temperature control, as we know, it's 41 degrees uh, or lower uh, degrees Fahrenheit or higher than 135 for uh, hot foods. So this is the other part of uh, the definition. So over here, items five, eight, and nine are new and pertain to the food carts or compact mobile food operations. Six and seven are um, existing. Um, and basically it's about cooking and seasoning to order, juicing or preparing beverages uh, for immediate service uh, that do not contain uh, frozen milk products such as ice cream. So five, eight, and nine, basically five, it, it allows for slicing and chopping of non-potentially hazardous foods or produce that has been washed at an approved facility. Or slicing and chopping of food that has been, uh, that it's been cooked on a heated surface, like a, a steak that is being cooked, you cook it and then you can cut it on that grill. Eight and nine, it's basically hot and cold holding and reheating of food that has been previously prepared at a commissary or another approved permanent facility. So do we have any questions, Cynthia, that we need to answer? Um, Sara, so uh, Elise McCaleb asks, what is an example of an open food? And Lisa Frias, the environmental health director answered, any food item that is not packaged and properly labeled is concerned open food. Whole raw produce is not considered open food. Um, Elise McCaleb asked, what is raw produce considered? And Lisa answered, raw whole produce is considered a prepackaged, non-potentially hazardous food. Other questions that we have is, uh, Brisa Sanchez, who says, hello, thank you for the presentation. Number one, where do ice cream Neve street food vendors fall in this? And number two, where can we find resources to commissary kitchens? Sara, if you'd like to answer that. Sure, so the first, uh, the second part, commissaries, uh, maybe the team can post that list. It's on our website, but we have it available. Um, and we'll be posting it yeah, momentarily on the chat. Uh, it would be the list of commissaries. There is like, we have three types of commissaries that are uh, available. We'll be talking uh, a little bit more um, into the presentation about options also for commissaries. So ice cream, the, qu the first question is ice cream, uh, where does it fall within the new law? Is that what it is? Um, where do ice cream, is street food vendors fall this? Yes, so that would be, you know, um, uh, Brisa, I'm going to cover specifically that type of facility, which is considered a low risk uh, in a couple more slides. So if you can just stay put and if you have further questions, we can address that, uh, you know, after I present that part, if that's OK. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, now back to your presentation. We'll take more questions later on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so. The um, some of the the, the general I'm going to go over the general requirements for all the types of food carts, but uh, we'll go also into the different types of food carts that uh, are available and what are the requirements to answer Brisa's question. Uh, you know that that would be the uh, low risk, and then we also have exempted facilities uh, or CMFOs. We also have so I'm going to go into all of that in detail a little bit. Uh, ahead uh, in a couple more slides, but first we're going to cover the requirements for all types of CMFOs, whether they are uh, low risk, moderate risk, or high risk, which is basically what uh, what we have. So all CMFOs have to have a business identification that is facing the customer, and it has to be uh, in this manner. 
the, the name of the business has to be uh, three inches high with the uh, city estate as zip code and name of the permit holder, like in the example, if it's different from the name of the facility, would be one inch high. Also, uh, in terms of the structural requirements, all the CMFO uh, operations or food carts should have equipment that is smooth, of a smooth material, easily cleanable, that is easily accessible, that is part of the cart or integral to the cart, unless it's a auxiliary unit that we covered uh, a little while ago. It has to be certified. So one of the certifications is the NF NSF certification. There are others, but it has to be certified for sanitation. Um, they, there also must be a first aid kit in as part of the uh, CMFO cart. As far as operational requirements for all CMFOs, uh, they need to provide overhead protection during operations and they need to make sure that the food that they sell is from an approved source, that it's uh, properly stored before, during, and after the operation that is protected from the elements and that they need to, uh, they, they have access to a commissary. So like I said before, these are the types of uh, compact mobile food operations that are available uh, as a result of the new law. And we're going to go into each one of those. Uh, first, we have the exempted uh, CMFOs. Then we'll go over the low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And um, so we'll we'll provide also some links to guide guidance documents that we have on our website. So uh, stay tuned for that on the chat. So the exempted uh, CMFO. So if you plan to sell only pre-packaged, properly labeled, non-perishable food that is limited to 25 square feet or less, then no health permit is required. However, and well, what type of food is this? Again, there are back chips, bottle drinks, or whole uh, produce, you know, on cat uh, uh, produce um, that is not cooked, okay? And then uh, they still must ensure that the food is from an approved source, that they provide overhead protection, that it's uh, properly stored before, during, and after the operation, that is protected from the elements like uh, dirt, dust, sewage, and vermin. And we may still do uh, investigations as a response of a complaint or a just cause. So that could still happen. Uh, so what uh, 25 square, square feet look like in an operation like this? Well, it's a food display of the food that it's uh, a 25 square feet area. So it could be a five by five. It could be a six by four, eight by three, something like that. You, you still need to uh, check with your city and make sure that you are following any restrictions or they may, if, even if we are... Um, you are exempted from getting a public health permit. You may not be exempted from getting a permit from the uh, city where you are going to be selling uh, on. So we have a flyer that it's a summary of these requirements, and I think the team is going to post it right now. So if you are interested in this type of per operation, uh, please uh, check that flyer. Uh, it has just been posted on the chat. So I'm going to go through the all the types of CMFOs, and then we're going to take some of the questions that I see are coming in on the chat. Um, so the low risk uh, CMFO, there is two types. So one of them is pretty much an extension of the exempted food facility. Uh, or CMFO just is more than 25 square feet. And these can obtain a permit to sell for many of the following, and they still be considered a CMFO. They can sell from a table, a stand, a rack, or a display. And the operational requirements are the same. They need to have overhead protection. They need to have food from an approved source. Uh, the food must be properly stored before, during, and after the operation, and they need to have access to a commissary. 
The second type of low risk uh, CMFO is to answer Risa's question would be the ice cream uh, uh, carts, CMFO carts. So these carts are uh, allowed to sell um, ice cream and uh, frozen food bars, no scooping, no scooping is allowed, so no open food. Everything has to be prepackaged. They don't require, uh, they are not required to submit a plan check but they are required to request an evaluation of the cart. And again, the requirements is to have an approved cart, a food from approved source. The food must be properly uh, protected from the elements before, during, and after the operation, and they need to have access to a commissary. And earlier we posted uh, guidance for the different uh, uh, list of commissaries that we, uh, we have permitted for ice cream carts and uh, food service. So make sure you check the chat for that. And I'll take your question a little bit. I, uh, Brisa, I saw it coming in, in a little bit. So we're just gonna go through this uh, and then take all the questions about the, the specific carts. So, Again, we're going over the exempted. We already went over the exempted type of CMFO, low risk, and now we're gonna cover the moderate risk. Maybe I'll take Brisa's questions, uh, Cynthia, since they're related to uh, the low risk specifically. Sure. Brisa Sanchez asks, if they are scooping, if they're scooping, is that okay? but does it require a different permit? Sarah? Yes, thank you. Um, so open food would be considered a moderate risk um, uh, CMFO. This being um, ice cream, I believe is still be a moderate risk. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, Jim or Lisa to clarify that, but I believe ice cream will be a moderate risk. CMFO. That's correct. Good? If it's scooping that's involved, anytime that you have open product, it's considered a potentially hazardous food and therefore it would be a moderate risk compact mobile food operation. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so that's all from Brisa. We can continue, Cynthia. Okay. Um, oh. Okay, no more questions from Brisa. Uh, I do have a question from Kimberly. Uh, her question is, will you guys be working with the Streets LA Sidewalk Program? Oh, excuse me. Sidewalk hey, Program so that everyone is on the same page. The city sometimes has no idea what health department actually allows, and it creates confusions for, for vendors. Sarah, if you'd like to shed some light on this. Yeah, I'll yeah, take so, that, Sarah, if you'd like, because yeah. I actually posted a response um, sure. to that. And so we actually are collaborating with the city of LA. Unfortunately, um, you know, the cities, just like other cities, do have the authority to implement sidewalk vending ordinances related to their city council approval. So we do collaborate with them and let them know what is allowed based on California Retail Food Code. But at the end of the day, they have the authority to adjust their ordinances as they feel um, are necessary for their prospective cities. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Cynthia, do we have one, uh, more questions or can we continue? We, we do have more questions. However, uh, with respect to everyone's time, uh, we should continue and we'll take more questions later. Sounds great. Thank you, everyone. We'll, we'll have a lot of time at the end to uh, get any questions that we don't get answered, but I'll, I'll break in a little bit more for, for a couple more questions. I just want to go over the other two types of uh, CMFOs, so it may clarify some of the questions as well. So uh, the next uh, type of CMFO that we'll go over is the moderate risk. So these are uh, uh, CMFOs or food carts that can sell potentially hazardous foods like um, it was mentioned, uh, ice cream or other items, and they can also conduct uh, limited food preparation. So we have sort of like two kinds of moderate risk. Um, in moderate risk, CMFOs could be selling prepackaged perishable food, 
uh, like prepackaged tamales, for instance, uh, and then just put them uh, on a bag to go. Um, and these would be able to sell from a food cart, a wagon, or other non-motorized conveyance. The requirements, the basic requirements are pretty similar to what we already discussed. They have to have a business identification, uh, post the permit in a visible location, uh, in integral uh, mechanical refrigeration or hot holding equipment that is part of the cart, of course, and approve storage, uh, overhead protection, and an approved commissary. So we'll get more details on the plan submission process for these types of conveyances later on the presentation. Another type of motor risk CMFO is uh, that those uh, facilities or CMFOs that sell unpackaged food. This is open food, right? Like a scooping ice cream or preparing a hot dog or beverages or uh, even uh, sandwiches, right? And these ones uh, have additional structural requirements, like they have to have mechanical refrigeration uh, for any cold holding and any hot holding equipment that has to be integral to the cart or part of the cart. If they conduct food preparation, they uh, could have spare utensils or a wear washing sink with warm water. Uh, they have to have a hand sink. Uh, sufficient counter space to prepare the food uh, within the cart in waste water uh, tanks. Again, no warm water is required for the hand sink, but they do have to provide uh, water uh, water under pressure, one gallon per minute uh, for that water. So these are some of the things that these motor risk can, uh, carts can do. So they can, uh, con under the new law, they can uh, conduct hot and cold holding and reheating of uh, food that has been prepared at a commissary or an approved uh, food facility, permanent food facility. They can conduct slicing of washed produce and they can do conduct food preparation for immediate service. In this case, because it's motor risk, it cannot include uh, raw meats, right? So no raw meats, raw fish, or raw poultry. And uh, immediate service can include the preparation, again, of hot dogs on a grill, or they can be maintained on the hot grill at 135 until uh, they are served. Uh, again, the food has to be kept, uh, perishable food or uh, potentially hazardous food has to be kept under 41 degrees for cold holding and above 135 uh, degrees Fahrenheit for hot holding. At the end of the operation, the food must be disposed. And of course, if conducting food preparation, you are required to have a food handler card and we would need you to also present uh, written operational procedures. We have a template we're gonna share in a little while with you on the chat. Um, so this is for moderate risk uh, facilities. So we've covered the exempt uh, types of CMFOs, low risk, moderate risk, and now we're going to cover those that can actually handle raw meats, raw poultry, or raw fish. And those are the high risk uh, CMFOs. But just remember that it's still the food preparation that they are able to do is still limited food preparation. So they cannot conduct complex preparation. And we're going to go over what some of those what some of those things are. I'm going to stop in a couple more slides to take some of the questions that I see coming on the chat. So, anyways, for high risk, they will be able to handle raw meats, raw poultry, or raw fish. Uh, they must follow all the requirements uh, on Chapter 10, unless it's specifically exempted on 11.7, uh, which is the CMFO chapter on the California Retail Food Code. Um, and they could slice raw meats or raw poultry on a, hot, on a heated surface. All the food must be disposed at the end of the day. Um, and these are the things that cannot be done on a, even a high-risk mobile uh, 
compact mobile food operation, which is they can add slice uh, perishable food, except uh, produce that is being washed at, a, at an approved facility or the surface is heated. Uh, they can add thaw. They can add cook uh, or cool for later use on the cart. So everything has to be repaired at a commissary or a permitted food facility. And they cannot serve or sell oysters. So at this point, I'm going to uh, take a quick break to uh, take some calls. Cynthia. Hey, thank you so much, Sarah, for this informative presentation. Uh, so Kimberly asks, what exactly needs to be included in a cart manufacturer at attestation? Does the manufacturer have to do something with health department prior to that? Sarah, if you'd like to share. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Kimberly. You know, that's a little bit ahead. Uh, did you get <laughs> did you get a handle of the presentation before? No. Uh, I, I will talk about that. We'll provide a template in a little bit. So if you can stay put, we'll go over that in more detail. And if you have further questions, we can definitely take them at that time. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Arnolfo Delgado asks, would you still need to get a business license or other approvals even if the CMFO is exempt? Thanks. Yeah, thank Sarah? you, Arnulfo. Yes, thank you, Arnulfo. Yes, uh, yeah, so you have to check with the city that you are going to be do doing business um, at. Uh, I know the city of LA will require those two items and perhaps uh, most of the cities. So yeah, you have to check with them what is their local, what are their local requirements. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, let's see. There are many wonderful questions coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. Victoria Knapp asks, where do carts that sell both whole fruit and cut fruit that's either cut and packaged prior or cut to order at the cart. I'm not sure I'm understanding that question. Uh, Victoria Knapp, uh, would you like to uh, unmute your mic and provide further clarification? So it says, where do carts that sell both whole fruit and cut fruit? Right. It may be related to what type of permit is required, and that would be considered a moderate compact mobile food facility if they are selling cut fruit. And if they are cutting the fruit at the commissary and selling it packaged, it would still be considered a moderate compact mobile food operation. All right, thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Thank you. J.D. Whittaker asks, are vertical roasters commonly known as trompos to cook raw meats allowed to be used with a CMFO? Oh, <laughs> um, that th those would be raw meats, right? I think if, if that would be a high risk cart uh, and it would have to go through plan check. Um, if the if everything is approved through plan check, that, that should be okay. Yeah, uh, so that you're right, Sarah, that would be considered a high risk cart. So it would have to have a full three compartment sink, a hand washing sink, and of course, um, you know, depending on the vertical roasters, may also require um, some ventilation. So you can always submit and go through our plan check process, and then we can walk you through what that looks like. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Uh, Anthony Estrada asks, who and where are the carts inspected? If anyone from the team would like to add, answer that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll take it. So the cart um, will initially be approved to operate um, either at the commissary or at one of our environmental health offices. Once a permit has been issued, then the actual inspection will be happening um, during operation. So we typically require that a route slip be submitted. That is a requirement for the county um, of Los Angeles that anytime you have a mobile food facility, a mobile food facility is required to submit a route slip that identifies where you're going to be operating so that our inspectors can go out and actually conduct on-site inspections. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll take this last question for now. 
Don Spago's Taylor asks, this moderate risk food cart allows for cooking any raw meats at an approved facility, then hot hold on site with the cart. Is this correct? Sarah? Yes. Yes, you are correct. Uh, you could prepare everything at a commissary or an approved um, facility, and we'll talk about commissary options in a couple more slides, and hot hold uh, on the cart. The cart would be a moderate risk cart if you don't handle any raw meats. And you could have a spare utensils uh, instead of a wear washing sink, or you could have the auxiliary units as an option for wear washing sinks. I mean, that you're, you're not required to have it, but if you don't want to have it as per utensils, you could have the auxiliary unit. Okay, thanks for all the terrific questions and all the insight that is being provided by the team. Uh, we will now go back to the presentation and take more questions in a little bit. Back to you, Sara. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so, um, one of the, the the things. So, once you have uh, your cart uh, in mind, and you say, "Okay, I'm gonna have something that is going to be unpackaged food," then you will be required to submit written operational procedures. And a simpler definition for uh, written operational procedures is instructions that are uh, step-by-step -step instructions that are follow for routine tasks. And they are like a, instructions for that come with a TV or a recipe, and um, they must be kept on the cart. Uh, there is a section for those of you interested on the uh, on this requirement on the California Retail Food Code. Is section 114303. And we also have, uh, like I uh, mentioned before, um, we have a uh, template that we'll be posting a uh, link to right now on the chat. And this uh, template um, walks you through the requirements, uh, the things that are required to be part of the written operational procedures, uh, like uh, you know the menu uh how do you do the food preparation how do you conduct the cleaning and sanitizing um and you can always uh, call us and we'll be happy to uh send it to you by email text or any any way that uh is accessible to you we have a um, a document that is in spanish as well for this uh, written operational procedures um and there is assistance available if you are um if you need it uh, there, there is a fee base on hourly rate, but we are happy to help uh, to help you navigate through the uh, writing of the of the operational procedures. So now that you've decided, you know what you want to sell and um, you know what type of card will support it. You need to know how you're going to get your card. And um, I believe uh, I saw a question from Joanna. Uh, about the standard cards. So we'll cover that in a little bit. Uh, so there are three options for getting a card uh, in terms of process for us. Uh, one of the options is uh, to purchase a standard card, and I'm gonna go into that next, uh, covering also the attestation. Then you can also get a card that has been previously permitted, and you can also get a card that you are going to design from scratch. So uh, the first um, the first option is to get a card from a standard plan. And there are some that are already existing in the market. We have uh, a link uh, that we're going to be sharing in a little bit uh, for the uh, list of manufacturers that we are aware of that you can call is a courtesy lease. We don't recommend anyone in particular, but you can call them and, and uh, check on the options that they have for you. And if they have in a standard plan, you want to make sure that these are pre-approved uh, uh, cards in a way. So what the only thing that you need for this is to request a side, side evalu um, card evaluation. So you don't need to submit plans, but you, you do need to request an evaluation of the cart. And uh, you need to pay a site evaluation fee. And you want to make sure you get that attestation from the manufacturer. And where I think we just posted the link 
to the attestation uh, template that we have. So you can have an idea of what it may look like. It doesn't have to be like this uh, particular format, but that's, uh, those, that's the basic information that would need to be included on uh, attestation document. You also need to provide the written operational procedures. And we're, we're going to walk you through all the steps and kind of give you an idea of what it looks like to go through this process of permitting the card. But that's one option for buying a card. Another option is to get it from another uh, permittee. And uh, you want to make sure that the cards have the certification stickers it's still affixed to the cart. Um, what is required in this case that you provide to us again is um, you are going to request an evaluation by checking that box on the mobile food facility plan check application. You are going to pay for that site evaluation and then uh, provide us with a written operational procedures for your operation and the um, public health permit from the previous owner. And looks something like the one on the slide. So the third option that you have is to build the cart from scratch like it is right now. So you will be uh, providing um, two sets of plans to with the application or the uh, Blank check application with a fee um, and the proposed menu. And that process of review of the plans on paper takes about 20 days. So you get feedback or you get them approved. So I can take some questions uh, quickly, maybe a couple, uh, Cynthia. Sure. Um, so Yovana asks Hello, what is the status of the approved standard cart designs? and what foods can be sold using these carts. Zara? Yeah, so we are approving plans, uh, standard plans, uh, as we receive the proposals. Um, and what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, she asked, and what foods can be sold using these carts? Yeah, basically any any foods, the standard plans, uh, it's, it's basically the plan check process that changes. And we'll see it in a couple more slides, but the types of cards that can be approved can can be any. And I'm not sure if, if Lisa or, yeah, or me, Jen. Yeah, I'll go ahead and clarify. So I just want to make sure. So when we get carts, some you know plans that are submitted for a compact mobile food operation, it typically it comes with what the proposed method of operation is. So, for example, we have our first model plan that was approved and it was approved as a tamale cart. So that cart has been specifically approved for the sale of tamales. So anybody who's coming in and who would like to purchase um, that cart with the manufacturer attestation, then all that would be required is a site evaluation, but they would only be able to sell the tamales pursuant to the approval of that cart. So the cart and the menu and the approval all go together. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. Um, let's see. Ivan Paz asks, in a moderate and high risk CMO, what are the sink sizes required for wear washing? And Lisa has answered this in the chat. There are minimum dimensions identified in the California Retail Food Code section 114313. Thank you for that, Lisa. Anthony Estrada asks, does the new law exempt vendors with permits issued prior to January 1st, 2023? And Lisa has answered this in the chat. There was no grandfather exemptions included in the California Retail Food Code. Thank you for that. Brisa Sanchez asks, how do these rules fall in place with pop-up markets, farmers markets, and food markets? Sarah, if you'd like to take that question. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that, Sarah, if you want. Yeah, yes, of course, thank yeah. you. Sure. So I want to make sure that there's different sections within the California Retail Food Code that applies to non-permanent food facilities. Um, non-permanent food facilities do include mobile food facilities. A compact mobile food operation is a type of mobile food facility. For those certified farmers markets, your food markets, those are actually considered temporary food facilities that are subject to a completely separate chapter 
within the California Retail Food Code and have different requirements. Temporary food facilities can only operate in conjunction with a community event or a certified farmer's market. Um, mobile food facilities can also operate as part of that community event or as part of that certified farmer's market with the approval of the certified farmer's market. So two different um, chapters within the California Retail Food Code, each with their own specific requirements. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Our next question is from Anthony Estrada. Does the new law only apply to vendor sales on public property? Would anyone from the yeah, team? Yeah, I'll go ahead like and take answer? it. Yeah, yeah sure. Mm -hmm. So the California Retail Food Code actually applies all across the state of California and doesn't just apply to public property. So anytime that you are selling food to the public or giving away food to the public, you are considered a food facility and have to comply with the California Retail Food Code. As Sarah mentioned, there are some exemptions to getting a permit, and that applies to people who are selling or offering 25 square feet or less of prepackaged, non-potentially hazardous food. So those are the only exemptions that, uh, you know, that are currently in the California Retail Food Code. We do, and as Sarah mentioned, we do not currently have micro enterprise home kitchen operations that are authorized in the County of Los Angeles. So at this point in time, Anybody who prepares food within their home is, um, unless they're a permitted or a registered cottage food operator, are unable to get a permit, and it is considered an unpermitted food activity. Thank you for that, Lisa. Uh, we'll take one more question from Anthony Estrada. Who inspects and approves the mobile carts? Yeah, so that is actually done here within Environmental Health. We have a mobile food program team. Um, and our plan check team that worked together to get these carts first plan checked and reviewed and then operationally inspected out in the field. So that is here within environmental health and that is a county function. That's not a city function, that's within the county of Los Angeles. Now, if you operate in the cities of Long Beach, the city of Pasadena or the city of Vernon, then you will contact those cities as they have their own health department. Thank you again, Lisa, for your expertise. Um, so thank you everyone for your great questions. Uh, we will now go back to the presentation. Uh, Sarah, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for all those good questions. And again, you know, if, if there are more questions that you think about later, uh, we're going to provide our contact information and we're happy to, uh, you know, give you more, more information about anything that you want to ask. Um, so just as a reminder, there is uh, three types of permits for CMFOs and one exemption. Uh, the three uh, permits is, are low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. And an important consideration uh, when you are um, searching for a food cart is to think about the type, the type of permit that you are going to need according to the food that you want to sell. So um, these are the, the three things to keep in mind in terms of permitting carts. And I have two cart scenarios and before we go to break and uh, maybe we can take a couple of questions. I think on time we're doing okay so far. Uh, so let me um, present to you a case here and um, you can type the answers on the chat if you want to take a stab at, at this question. So we have uh, uh, Sophia who wants to purchase a cart for from her friend, Alan. So what are the three things that Sophia must submit to us in order for her to get her uh, cart evaluated and start the permitting process? So if any of you want to take a stab at, th at that, um, that would be great. And let me see if I see any answers here. Um, so I'm going to uh, help you with the, one of the things that would be, uh, yes, Sophia would need to uh, get the public health permit from Alan. Uh, she would also need to submit the plan check application uh, and check the MFF evaluation box. 
and uh, pay the evaluation fee. So those are the three things that you need to provide when you are uh, getting or you're trying to get your cart permitted uh, that you bought from a previously permitted uh, owner. And I have one more here. Um, do we have more questions, uh, Cynthia? I can go to questions or I can do Alan's, uh, I mean, Nelson's scenario. Um, yes, we do have some great questions coming in. Okay. Okay. Um, so, oh, I just lost it. Excuse me, just one no, moment. No, that's okay. No problem. Take okay. your time. I'm going to go quickly. Uh, you, you ready? Uh, yes. Uh, Kimberly asks, can a food truck be an approved kitchen or prep space for a cart? Yeah. No. So I'll go ahead and tackle that one, Sarah. At this point yeah. in time, no, food trucks are not able to support um, other mobile food facilities as those themselves are required to have a commissary in order to be able to operate. Thank you. Uh, Arnolfo Delgado asks, uh, would you still need to get a business license or other approvals even if the CMFO is exempt? And Lisa has answered this in the chat. Uh, she wrote, you would need to check with the city that you plan to operate in to verify their licensing requirements. Exactly. And I believe there's one more question by J.D. Whitaker. He asks, he or she asks, would that employees need their own food handlers card? Yes, yes. I think Lisa also just answered that yeah, one. She, yes, she just answered that. Yes, all food employees would need to have their own food handler card. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other new questions at this point. So, Sarah, if you'd like to go back to the presentation. Sure, uh, no problem. Um, we'll take more questions again. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, actually. So if you uh, want to return a phone call or, you know, take a little bit of water, whatever you need to do, we're going to take a five minute break just so we're all fresh. So the five minute break will start. Right now.
Thank you. Welcome back to the presentation. Sara, uh, if you could continue the presentation. Sure, thank you very much. I hope everybody uh, appreciated that five minute break. <laughs> and uh, so I have two, two scenarios I could go over, but we can also take some questions uh, that are pending. Um, uh, Cynthia, so why don't we do that? Go ahead and take the questions and then if uh, necessary, I'll go over two scenarios before our next section. Sure. Uh, so Kimberly asks, I understand the food trucks require a commissary, but all of their prep is done on the food truck. Can food be cooked on there and supplied for the cart? And the cart would have its own commissary? Yeah, and, and uh, no, I mean, right now, I, um, I'm i sorry, uh, Kimber it's a Kimberly? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, we, right now, the only commissaries, I'm going to go over the, the options for commissaries that you have in a couple more slides, but it's actually the next section, but it doesn't include a food truck. Uh, even though the food truck has uh, a three compartment sink and everything else, uh, like Lisa mentioned earlier, our director, uh, it's they, they still need to be serviced at a commissary. So at this point, uh, no, they would have to have one of the options that I'm going to cover in the next couple of slides. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Uh, Arnolfo asks, are there any restrictions on where CMFOs can operate? For example, are they currently allowed to operate at County Beaches and Marina del Rey? Thanks. Yeah, so I'll tackle that one. Um, we mm -hmm. don't, once again, I want to make sure that we're kind of clear on what we in environmental health do. So we are responsible for approving of the actual compact mobile food operation. We don't have any authority as far as where or how you can operate if you are a permitted mobile food facility. So you do need to check with, in this situation, beaches and harbors to see whether or not, or Marina Del Rey, if they have any requirements or restrictions for sidewalk vending um, with respect to an ordinance. So again, we only permit the compact mobile food operation um, because it is a mobile food facility. It can operate from a county perspective anywhere in the county, as long as it has a permit from the county of Los Angeles with the exception of those three cities I mentioned. However, where you operate and when you operate um, is typically outlined based on city ordinances or if not any, um, you know, beaches and harbors or any type of other private property restrictions that may be put into place. Thank you, Thank Lisa. You, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Anthony Estrada asks, who handles enforcement? Will the county confiscate carts for repeat violators? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and I'll take that one. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. you know, with respect to, there's going to be, you know, when it comes to enforcement, it depends on what, law is being violated. So if it's a violation of the California Retail Food Code, then Environmental Health does, is the enforcement agency. Um, and we typically will dispose of the food that we find that's being um, produced in an unapproved manner. With respect to confiscating the equipment at this point in time, no, we are not confiscating equipment. Um, but other, you know, other city or county departments um, if say for example you know somebody leaves their cart um, then at that point in time they may actually um, confiscate it because it's left it's abandoned equipment um, so everybody does have the authorities um, based on the violations that are being observed um, so if there's for example um, grease that's being disposed um, you know on public property then public works or code enforcement from a city can actually go out and issue a citation for that violation. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we'll take two more questions. Uh, Kimberly asks, can a cart operator buy food from a mobile food facility and offer it for sale out of the cart? Yeah, so that one I will actually tackle too. Um, you know, it's yeah. really important. If that mobile food facility is now selling food, like, you know, wholesaling that food. So for example, they're now selling it to someone else that now requires another license from the state because they are now becoming a food process register. Um, registration is required, a PFR. 
And so um, it's really important that if you do that, that the mobile food facility operator understands that they may be subject to additional requirements. Um, what we are, of course, concerned about is that food that's being sold or offered is coming from an approved source. So that mobile food facility would be considered an approved source, um, but they may be subject to additional um, laws. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, the last question we'll take at this point is Chris Dams asks, does a CMFO have to operate within 200 feet of an approved bathroom facility? Would anyone uh, like to answer that? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, go ahead, Lisa. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, Sarah. I mean, this one's, <laughs> this one's an easy it, one, right? It's, uh, so um, it is when uh, it's a uh, location specific, um, uh, a CMFO. Yeah, well, actually, so I want to clarify, though. Okay. So, yeah, CMFOs do have to operate within 200 feet an approved bathroom facility. There is a carve out that was just included in SB 972, and that is if you have multiple employees that are at that location and are um, working, then at that point in time, no, there is an exemption that says you don't have to operate within 200 feet of a bathroom because one employee can go and drive to wherever they need to drive to go to the, you know, to use the restroom and then come back. But if you only have one food employee that is at that location and they're operating that compact mobile food operation, then they do have to be within 200 feet of a bathroom facility. And that of course is if they are in that same location for more than an hour. So if you have a roaming, you know, kind of compact mobile food operation, then at that point in time, you know, they're roaming and should have access to restrooms also. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you everyone for all the uh, insightful questions. Uh, let's return to learning about what the new sidewalk food vending law is. Sarah? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for the questions again, and uh, we'll continue. I have a, a little, a couple of uh, card scenarios. I'm just going to go through them with you. Uh, so this is the case of a standard plan. So we have a person, uh, his name is Walter. He wants to buy a cart made from a standard plan, uh, like the tamale cart that uh, Lisa mentioned, uh, for example, and uh, we want to make sure that he knows what he needs to submit uh, to start the permitting process. So he needs to submit that at the station from the manufacturer because food carts made from a standard plants are considered pre-approved. So the vendors need uh, to provide that uh, manufacturer at the station and they can start the process with that. We're going to go over actually the steps for each one of the three ways of getting a cart. Uh, just as a reminder, the standard card, the previously permitted card, and the one that is built from scratch. Um, then we have uh, this case is somebody that uh, Anna is buying a card from her friend who says he had a permit before. So does Anna need to submit plans? No, the answer is no, because the uh, card was previously approved. Um, so what does she need to submit? The public health permit from uh, the previous owner. And uh, she needs to ensure that the uh, certification sticker is still uh, at effects to the cart. And when buying one of these carts, you want to make sure that um, it's kind of like a like-to-like -like, uh, purchase. So if you are going to be selling tamales, you want to make sure that th that cart that you are buying has at least that capacity to handle tamales. Um, and then, you know, it would it would probably uh, have an easier uh, time going through the um, inspection of the cart, because if it's not, if you're trying to bring uh, something that, trying to sell something that is more complex than tamales, you may have to submit uh, plans for remodeling or, pro or just start from, from scratch. So, um, I see a hand up. I'm going to go into the options for uh, commissaries, but I think we can take that hand up. Uh, uh, Cynthia, if you want to go to uh, the person that is raising their hand. Sure. Um, so someone's on the call. I have now allowed your mic. Please go ahead and unmute yourself so you can ask your question.
Um, I don't know if they can add on it. So we'll come back to you. Let me just go. Uh, let me just go over a couple of sections. I just didn't want to have you with your hand up too long, but I, I don't think uh, either they can add unmute themselves or um, they need more time. So we'll we'll come back to the person that is raising their hand. Uh, thank you. Um, so once you have a cart, what's next, right? So you determine the type of food that you want to sell. You uh, determine what type of cart you are going to need, whether it's a low risk, a moderate risk, or a high risk cart, or if you are exempted. So now you need to determine what type of commissary you would need, right? So uh, the type of commissary that you choose has to be able to support the food preparation that you're going to conduct before uh, starting your uh, operations, your business on the cart. They it needs to support your food storage, cleaning of utensils and equipment, uh, cleaning of the cart. Um, you need to be able to fill uh, portable water tanks if you have those on the cart, if they're required need to be able to uh, allow you to dispose li liquid liquid waste and um, storage of the cart. So what are those options for you under the new um, bill SB 972, part now of the California Retail Food Code? Well, the first option, and we're going to post uh, now uh, the list of commissaries that we have on the chat. Team is going to do that right now. But the uh, first option is those that are already permitted. Those that have a current uh, permit with us, uh, you can check those lists that we just posted. And uh, you would need to uh, make sure that they have a permit, of course, a valid permit. Uh, we try to update this list uh, frequently, but you, know, you still want to check for that. Um, you want to be uh, sure that they are able to support your type of business. And uh, you would need to identify their name and address on the application for your public health permit, uh, like it's shown on the picture there. So you want to make sure you have that information. So that's option one. Option two would be a business uh, that is a permitted food facility that has a type of permit like the one that is shown on the screen. This is the type of permit you want to uh, make sure that they have. It could be a restaurant, a food market, uh, something similar to that. And we would need to conduct a site evaluation uh, to make sure that that type of facility or restaurant can uh, support your business. And, um, you know, they have the space uh, for your cart if you want to leave it there too. And the CMFO operation would need to get an additional dependent food operator permit. And uh, we can walk you through all of that if you need to. We'll again provide the contact information at the end. So uh, your option three is uh, to see if there is a commercial kitchen in a church or a school or any other organization that has a commercial kitchen uh, that doesn't have a permit, but they want to support vendors or or you in particular, and they are willing to allow you to uh, conduct food preparation. So you would need to request, again, the site evaluation, site evaluation, and um, that would determine what type of support they can provide. So if they can support your operation, that would be uh, approved. And then uh, they would need to uh, apply for a public health permit for a commissary uh, if they are approved uh, with a payment. If they wanted to say, oh, now I have a permit, now I can, you know, serve food like a restaurant or sell uh, uh, food, uh, you know, for retail, then they would need to have through, uh, they, they, need, they would need to have to go through the whole plan check process for that type of permit. So uh, it's important to realize that, that they would be approved without plans, with just a site evaluation to support a, a CMFO. But if they want to go beyond that, they would need to submit plans and go through the whole plan check process like any other regular facility. So an option, uh, an additional option, and this is mostly for a storage only, it's the uh, ability uh, that the new law provides to use a private home uh, for a storage. 
Now, this private home is not a commissary, so you cannot prepare food or do all these other things uh, in, in the uh, private home. Basically, what you uh, would be able to do, you can store up to two carts. You need to requ uh, request uh, what is called an endorsement, and it's basically an evaluation from us to make sure that the home space that you're allowing for the storage of your cart and perhaps prepackaged non-perishable food or whole produce only. Uh, it could be stored in a in a proof manner. Um, they any any food preparation, cleaning, and servicing has to be done at another permitted facility that has been approved to do that, like in the previous slide we mentioned, um, or um, at a permitted uh, commissary or um, permitted food facility. Um, so we are going to post on the chat the guidance if you are interested on in storing a cart at home. And we're going to talk about, walk you through a couple of the scenarios for the different types of CMFOs, what could work and what could not work in terms of a commissary option. So um, again, feel free to uh, look at those guidelines that we're posting or call us and we can provide them to you. So I have uh, one exercise um, I want to share with you uh, just for fun, and then we can take all those questions that are coming in. So we have a commissary exercise here from uh, Sophia, who wants to sell tamales and coffee from a cart on the sidewalk. And the question is, can she prepare tamales at her home? Yes or no? Um, if you agree with me, well, the answer would be no, because a home is not a um, is not an approved uh, commissary, right? So then, uh, can she add uh, cream and sugar? This is more operational cream and sugar to coffee when requested by customers. Uh, she could, if the card has a hand washing sink and she has a spare utensils. So this is just a quick example to help us understand a little bit of what we've been talking about. So I'm uh, happy to take more questions, uh, Cynthia, before going into the actual permitting process. Terrific. So we have a caller with the last four uh, numbers, um, 2534. Um, since you're participating via telephone, please press star six to mute and unmute yourself. At this point, please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Hi. Hi, caller. Okay, how, how are you are doing? You? Good morning. Hi. Good uh, Good morning. Yeah, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, some, somebody can translate my question or I will try in English. Yeah. But my, no, no, no. Hey, yo puedo traducir. I'll be happy to translate. Uh, uh, yeah, dígame. Muchas gracias. Sí. Disculpe, mi pregunta es que yo leí en la ley SB 972 uh -huh. que fue aprobada, que decían que ya no ocuparíamos comisarías o chair kitchen. Ok. Y que uh, quería, también que... se podrían tener puestos uh, como esos que son de lona en okay. vez de trailers o carros porque no podíamos costear esos gastos. Ok, ok, permítame tantito, déjeme traducir lo que está preguntando. Sí, uh, so, el, uh, so the caller is asking that she read on SB 970, that the new law SB 972 would allow uh, for um, commissaries exemptions and that they could also set up on the street uh, tent uh, to sell. Continúe, señora. Entonces, estaba escuchando aquí que todavía necesitaremos comisarias y chair kitchens. Entonces, la ley SB 972 no fue aprobada o qué fue lo que sucedió? Que todavía escucho aquí que necesitaremos comisarias y chair kitchens. Sí, muchas gracias por su pregunta. Mire, dos, le contesto muy rápidamente. Le invito a que nos acompañe a nuestra presentación completamente en español, si es más fácil, el 27 de abril. 
vamos a tener una presentación completamente en español y podemos ahondar más en sus preguntas. Eh, déjenme nada más traducir lo que estoy diciendo, por favor. So uh, the caller is asking if uh, if this is not true, then that they uh, that uh, food carts would still need a uh, commissary, and uh, she's wondering if that is because the law, the new law, wasn't approved, or what's going on. So uh, the answer for this question is uh, well. I, I recommend the caller to join us uh, for this. Uh, Spanish webinar fully in Spanish on April 27 at 10 o'clock, but also um, the law was approved and it does provide uh, three additional commissary options that we are just we had just covered um, and we can walk you through those options. There is uh, it is not true that uh, commissaries are now not required, so I just want to make sure that that's clear. Commissaries are still required, but there are three more options for people uh, to um, to to choose from. And uh, we're going to talk about the the food pop ups or these uh, setups uh, that are cooking food on the street uh, at the end of the presentation. And we're also going to give you uh, a possible solution for that. Uh, Lisa, would you like to add anything to that? No, you did a great job. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, thank you. So, señora, mire, le, le comento, uh, so I'm going to translate real quick to the caller. Uh, señora, le comento que fíjese que sí, sí pasa, pasó la ley y, y sí probé tres nuevas opciones para comisarías. Eh, las acabo de cubrir, pero si se le hace un poquito más fácil, podemos a, ayudarle eh, si nos llama o si también uh, nos acompaña en la reunión del 27. Sí, o sea, sí se requiere comisaría, pero hay tres nuevas opciones. Quiero que quede claro. Y al final de la presentación vamos a hablar sobre los puestos en la calle. Y, y, y sí, efectivamente no son aprobados por esta ley, pero hay alguna opción que queremos compartir. Si nos gusta, si se gusta mantener con nosotros, vamos a cubrir eso al final. ¿Está bien? Sí, sí me mantengo. Gracias. Y regreso también en la de español. Exacto. Bueno, gracias. Hasta luego. Ok, uh, Cynthia, okay. go ahead. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, um, we will take more questions later. Uh, Sarah, if you could go back to the presentation. Thank you very much. Sure. So, so we're going to talk now about the uh, summer, the, the permitting process. So, uh, what does it, uh, wh what is the, the uh, what are the steps for a card uh, to be permitted and approved and to for the CMFO to finally get the public health permit. So uh, the first step, so this is for, we have three, three uh, flows, three uh, different uh, scenarios. Uh, one is when you purchase the card from a standard plan. And the first step would be for you to submit the plan check application. As we mentioned before, uh, checking the evaluation, the MFF evaluation box, then you would submit with that documentation that is listed here, the written operational, uh, I'm sorry, the written attestation that we uh, provided a template earlier, written operational procedures, and the commissary support documents. You would also submit a payment for that evaluation. We will schedule on a step two an appointment to do the card evaluation. Step three would be uh, to take the, the uh, CMFO card uh, to be evaluated. And if the card uh, passes the evaluation, a certification sticker will be uh, applied to the card. And then you will be able to go into a step four, which would be uh, applying for the public health permit. Um, you would need to submit um, ownership documents with that, uh, like your ID, you know, um, uh, license, uh, business license, seller's permit, all these things, depending, uh, you know, what you have. Uh, if you are an LLC, then you would have to submit that as well. Um, and then you'll receive an invoice that needs to be paid uh, for the public health permit within seven days. That fee for the permit is an annual uh, fee. 
And uh, once you pay that, you'll receive a temporary document that is good for about 30 days while you receive your public health permit on, on the mail. And that then you'll be able to operate since this is step when you're getting the temporary uh, document that allows you to operate. So the applications may be submitted in person or via email. So uh, let us know if you need help with that. And we're posting uh, the uh, links to the applications on the chat. So you would need a, a public health permit application. And then there is a supplemental application that goes with that for uh, compact mobile food operations or mobile food facilities. OK, so the next uh, case is when you have a cart that you purchased from a previously permitted uh, person uh, or business, and it's pretty similar to the one we just uh, walked th walk you through. Uh, again, you submit an application uh, and check the box for the evaluation. Uh, the documentation is a little bit different uh, because, of course, you don't have an attestation from the manufacturer, but um, we ask you to provide the commissary documents, the written operation procedures, and the evaluation fee. Two and three are pretty similar. You'll make an appointment, you'll go to the appointment, and if the cart is approved, then the CMFO unit gets a certification sticker, and then you are ready to do number four, which again is the same as the previous one, and it's um, applying, submitting the application for the public health permit uh, with your ownership documents. Uh, you uh, have you receive an invoice after that. You pay that within seven days, and then you'll receive a uh, temporary uh, uh, document that will allow you to operate while you get your public health permit in the mail. Again, applications can be submitted by email or in person. And last uh, case is when you're building a CMFO from scratch. So this is the pretty much the current process. This is a little bit different from for steps one and two and a little bit on three. So in this case, you need to submit a full plan check application, uh, two sets of plans, plan check fee, and the documents that are required at this time is just the proposed menu. Then you would submit that if the plans, uh, when the plans are approved, then you are okay to build the cart and schedule a final inspection of the cart. Um, I want to say that the uh, fee for the plan check includes two reviews of the paper uh, plans and two inspections of the actual cart. Everything addition, anything additional to that will be, uh, would incur in uh, additional fees. Uh, documents that you need to present on a step two are the commissary documents and the written operational procedures. Uh, on a step three, if the cart is approved, uh, then you're ready again to, uh, you'll get a uh, certification sticker, and then you're ready to go to a step four, which is the um, application for the public health permit. But if the cart is not approved, then you need to make corrections and make a new appointment to uh, submit uh, you know, the cart to, for evaluation again. So again, you can submit the applications via email or in person. And I'm gonna take additional questions, Cynthia. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. So Lisa has been uh, providing a lot of responses. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, let's see. One question by Jerry Tucker is, if a home is being used for storage of more than two carts, would the county investigate? Thank you. And Lisa answers, yes, this could be reported to Environmental Health at phone number 888 seven zero zero nine 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 five or by email at the uh, public health environmental health uh, complaint form web the website provides the form and you can place that in mm -hmm. uh, anthony estrada asks i'm with code enforcement if a cmfo is operating without a county health permit what county or state code can or will cite 
we can cite for not having a business license. Yeah, so um, Lisa, you want to take that one? No, go ahead. Oh, OK, uh, yeah, so so, you know, if most cities will require a public health permit in order for them to give them a license. So, of course, if they don't have a uh, public health permit, I'm assuming they wouldn't uh, have a, a license uh, permit from the city. Now, if the city doesn't have that requirement, then um, I'm not sure the particulars of the local locality that uh, Anthony uh, works for, but it, you would have to check with you know your your local code and see if there is something there that you can cite. If this is an unincorporated area, uh, I'm not sure if that's different, Lisa. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, I think Anthony, and hopefully I'm answering your question. Is that you know, if you, as always, as, as Sarah's saying, so yes, you of course have the authority to force the business license, um, but the violation is the California Health and Safety Code, and it's Section 1143 NE7, which requires that any food facility that's required to have a permit operate with a permit. And so there are penalties um, that are associated with that. So um, we would be citing that section along with any other violations that are noted as part of our investigation. And Anthony um, responds with Hawaiian Gardens for the specific location he is referring to. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I would definitely um, go ahead and Anthony, if you would like, um, you can contact us, you know, via, um, you know, issuing a complaint or you can contact me directly at 626-430-5374 um, and I'll be able to answer any additional questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, a guest asks, can a restaurant prepare food on site and be allowed to obtain a permit to sale as a sidewalk vendor? Sarah or Lisa? Sure. So uh, if I understand correctly, this is a restaurant that wants to have a CMFO cart outside the restaurant. I, I'm hoping that that's the, the question, but I think it's you know, there's two there's two things that can be addressed here, right, Sarah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you want to tackle both situations? <laughs> Again, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so one one th um, option is uh, if they want to have a uh, um, CMFO permit. Yes, they could do that. They could uh, obtain a permit. They cannot just set up outside. Uh, you know, cart in and uh, under the same permit for the restaurant. If uh, the question is, can they just put a, a table outside the restaurant and uh, operate, you know, the use um, operate outside of the restaurant? The answer is no, that's not allowed. Um, unless the the setup is within the property of the restaurant and everything is enclosed, but that wouldn't be outside necessarily. So um, I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure, Lisa, you want to add anything? Yeah. No, no, you're right. So yeah, if you have a compact mobile food operation that has a permit and you want to operate that um, outside your restaurant, as long as you're in compliance with any of the, once again, city um, requirements as far as vending or property um, rules, um, then that's fine, but you cannot just, you know, set up a pop-up tent and tables and start selling outside your restaurant. Thank you very much. And we have another question in the chat. Elizabeth asks, are there any new commissaries being approved? Most of the commissaries are already at full capacity, especially here in the San Fernando Valley. And this was answered by Lisa in the chat box. Uh, we are sharing with all participants. We recognize that commissaries continue to be an issue, and as a result, the California Retail Food Code was modified to create greater flexibility for us to evaluate potential commissary options. We hope that more operators understand that opening a commissary is a great opportunity to support mobile food vendors. And with that being said, uh, we will continue the sidewalk food vending law presentation. Sarah, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, it's great questions. And um, 
We're going to try to provide more answers uh, with the information that is uh, coming up on this presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, towards the end of the presentation, some of the uh, uh, pop up food pop ups that are not allowed, some of the things that are being done that cannot uh, cannot be done or could be done with some modifications on the carts. And um, but we're, we're going to continue for now with uh, talking about the cost and the permit fees. So uh, once you, you know, you, you may, if you want to know what, what is the cost, we're going to uh, have a couple of scenarios here, but we have one-time fees and annual fees. So one-time fees are those that are incurred at the beginning, mostly, or whenever you have a um, modification to your operation, which are a plan check submission, uh, mobile food facility evaluation fee, uh, if you want a commissary uh, or an auxiliary unit evaluation, commissary um, option, you know, like the permanent food facilities or churches that uh, uh, want to be evaluated uh, to be able to support uh, food carts, uh, CMFOs, those, those are uh, additional evaluations that are one-time fee. Uh, there are annual permits attached to some of those um, that we're going to cover in a couple of scenarios and those all the public health permits are renewed annually and those are the only annual fees that we have. Uh, so let me, uh, I think we're posting right now on the chat for you um, a fact sheet with the current fees and as we mentioned before the Board of Supervisors is going to review our proposed fees on May 23rd uh, coming up, and we also have a document with the proposed fees um, uh, that is being posted right now on the chat. We have also frequently asked questions with more scenarios for you to review. So if you need any of that, you can look it up on the chat or call us and we'll be happy to provide that. So uh, to start with uh, two cases, so in, for instance, for uh, low risk uh, CMFOs, those selling prepackaged, non potentially hazardous foods that are 25 square feet or more. The uh, cost on the, and, and this is for a previously permitted cart or a standard cart, right? It's not something that is built from scratch. This is a previously permitted cart or standard. One of the uh, cases could be that uh, on the plan check process, the only Really, what it changes is the commissary. So, step step three has A and B options, but for the first step uh, one, the only cost you have is the cart cost, and that's not with us. That's we you know with whoever you're going to purchase the cart from. Uh, then you have a uh, cart inspection. We do charge the cart cart evaluation fee. Then you have um, step three, the commissary uh, setup choices. And you could just uh, go to a commissary and pay their fees. You don't need to pay anything to us in that case. Uh, and again, if you, unfortunately there is not enough commissaries in the area where you are, or you don't, um, that's not something that's going to work for you. You can also pay a home endorsement fee. We're talking about low risk CMFOs, those that have only pre-packaged, non-potentially hazardous foods. You could use a home to uh, store your cart and the food, you need to request that home uh, endorsement. And there is a fee for that. It's an initial fee. And then you also need to pay for the public health permit for the CMFO. And that would be your total cost. So cart evaluation fee, home endorsement fee, and annual permit fee. So in the case that you wanna build your cart from scratch for a low risk uh, CMFO, you uh, would need to pay for the plan check on the steps one and two. And again, that fee covers two reviews of the paper plans and two uh, inspections of the cart when it's built, two initial inspections for to get it approved. And that's covered on that initial fee. And of course, whatever the cart cost, that's also included on your cost, total cost. Then you have the commissary uh, setup choices and you have A and B. So again, A is just going to a regular uh, commissary that is already permitted permitted and paying their fees. You don't pay anything to us in that case. 
But if you want to have an endorsement uh, uh, from for a home, then you could, again, leave the prepackaged, non-potentially hazardous food products at home in your cart if approved, and that would be the fee for um, the endorsement, and then you need to pay the annual fee. So that would be your total cost. So next, I'm going to uh, cover for uh, costs for moderate or high risk CMFOs. This is when they are built from a standard. I mean, when I when they are permitted from a uh, from a, a cart that was built from a standard plan, or a cart that is previously permitted for a moderate or high risk. So the initial cost, because there is no plan check fee, is just your cart cost, cost your cart cost, and then the cart inspection. Uh, you need to pay for that. That's an evaluation fee. And you have three options for the commissary uh, setup in terms of cost. So you can just, again, pay for the commissary fees. You don't pay anything to us. Or uh, option B gives you the ability to uh, leave, prepare your food, use a permitted food facility, prepare food there, do all the cleaning, and leave your cart there. If you are able to do that, then you would just pay for that permitted uh, facility evaluation, and uh, as far as that commissary setup, you you probably you you would need to pay for two permits on the step four. One is the CMFO and the um, dependent operator, dependent food operator. Uh, but then uh, that would be on the step four. For uh, option three C, uh, let's say that you have a food facility that says, yeah, you can prepare everything here, you can use it as a commissary, but we don't have a space for your uh, cart. So then you could actually pay for a home endorsement and have that cart stored only at a, at a private home. So you would pay two fees for that evaluation of the permanent food facility and the storage of the cart. And on the step four, you would be paying uh, for a, a permit fee for the CMFO and for the um, uh, dependent food operator. So that would be your total cost. Um, and we have some scenarios on the uh, frequently asked questions for the proposed fees uh, that you can review in more detail. And this is the case for the moderate or high risk uh, cost for those cards built from scratch. So again, in step one and two, it's included on the plan check fee, and uh, you will also pay for your cart. Uh, cart. And then uh, commissary options, they're pretty much the same here. Uh, basically, the only difference with the previous slide is step one and two. Uh, but the commissary options, I'll go over it again. Uh, you know, One, you can just pay a commissary, and you don't have any fees to pay to us. Or you can go uh, three uh, B, you can leave your card and do all your uh, food preparation and cleaning at a permitted food facility. That would be that fee uh, for that evaluation, or you can request um, an evaluation for a home endorsement if you need um, to leave the card um, at home. And on the step four, again, you'll be paying for two permits for in the cases for 3B and 3C, which is the uh, permit for the CMFO, and the permit for the dependent food operator. So that's as far as the fees. I'm not sure if there's any specific questions on the fees. Uh, if there are some, we can talk about that. If not, we will continue and talk about uh, the timeline and what we are doing here in environmental health for preparing now to permitting and all that. Cynthia? Uh, thank you, Sara. Uh, Madeline LAPL asks, is there any regulation of commissary costs? Regulation? There yeah, is. Yeah, so I was going to say, I think the question is, is whether or not, I mean, so it's a public, it's a business, right? So we don't have the authority to, um, our oversight over how much a commissary charges for the use of their commissary. Sarah, I don't know if you have anything else that you wanted to add. 
No, no, that's that's pretty much it. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, and there are no other questions at this point. So, Sara, you may continue. Yes, and uh, you can uh, type your questions uh, on the chat or raise your hand. We have about uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes more on the presentation, and then we'll open the floor for more questions if you have any that you haven't asked. So uh, as far as the timeline, once the application is finished, how soon can you get your permit? Um, like I said before, a temporary uh, a document that allows you to operate, it's issued once your uh, public health permit application is approved, and then you will receive your uh, actual permit, like the one on the picture here, uh, within 30 days, uh, you would get that on the mail. So what, um, what are we doing as uh, public health uh, to implement this law? We well, were meeting with manufacturers. We met with uh, manufacturers in December. Uh, and since then, we've been working with them. Uh, we're training our inspectors to be ready to conduct uh, inspections and approved carts. We're getting uh, the permit fees approved by the Board of Supervisors, as mentioned before, uh, on May 23rd uh, coming up. Uh, if the, the fees are approved, then they'll be effective on July 1st. And uh, we're conducting some outreach uh, workshops like this one, webinars like this one, and developing um, guidelines, educational materials. You should visit our website. We have a lot of information there. Uh, and again, you can always uh, call us and uh, we're happy to help. Uh, you can also um, subscribe to get notified like uh, for workshops like this one. You can share the link with other people that you think may be interested. And before we go, uh, what we never really uh, like to discuss enforcement that much, it is important that all vendors understand what can happen when uh, not following the state laws. This does not include uh, compliance, of course, with other local or city ordinances that are also in place. For example, sidewalk vending ordinances, ADA compliance, local and use of uh, zoning ordinances. So we're going to go over a couple of uh, things that we want to clarify for the public and for the vendors or those interested in vending. So first of all, let's talk about a little bit about our inspection process. Uh, our inspections uh, may occur at a commissary or during the street food vending activities. Um, for permitted facilities or permitted uh, mobile food facilities, um, we inspect uh, our inspection frequency is based on risk. So uh, CMFOs that are low risk are inspected every other year. Uh, moderate risk uh, CMFOs and mobile food facilities are inspected once a year. Um, high risk, they're inspected twice a year. And we also do complaints. We respond to complaints uh, for permitted and unpermitted uh, facilities. Um, our inspectors look for the following things when um, conducting inspections. They look for operational compliance with the code, the regulations we discussed. They looked at the written operational procedures, the food handler card when it's required. And at the end of the inspection, they are going to issue an inspection report. They're going to review it with the operator. They're going to explain what are the uh, violations and they're going to explain when they need to be complied by uh, and how, what type of, what compliance looks like. They're going to post a grade and uh, or score. And if the violations identified are not corrected, uh, they may issue a fine. So we may issue a fine. For unpermitted food vending, uh, that you know, there are a lot of uh, unapproved carts that we've seen on the street, and we'll show you some examples in a couple more slides. Uh, there are also unapproved activities. So when our inspectors go out for this, uh, you know, to respond to complaints, uh, something uh, that we need to check that uh, we receive a complaint that they are they don't have a permit. 
um, we can go uh, at any time when uh, the complainant uh, has told us the operation is happening. And again, these are typically based on complaints. And uh, the inspectors are going to look for uh, things on the right side of your screen, you know, the health permit, if they're handling open food, if, if the food is coming from an approved source or not, they're going to provide educational materials as to how to get a permit. And they are going to uh, provide an inspection report where, where, where they're going to detail uh, the things that need, need to be done for the operation to be compliant. Uh, if those uh, things are not corrected, if they, are, they don't pull a permit, then fines can escalate to up to three times the amount of the public health permit. And that's uh, that would be a starting next year, January 1st, 2024. Okay, so we're gonna go over some of the things that we've seen. So on your right, uh, some of you may have seen uh, these type of setups that have just a grill and we don't know, they don't have a permit. We don't know where the food is being prepared, where it's uh, coming from and is not protected from the elements. On the left, we see a permitted card, what it looks like. Uh, it's a plan that went through plan check. Uh, it's conducted, conducting only limited food preparation, uh, such as uh, steam or boiled hot dogs and tamales in the original inedible wrapper. So we have a couple more examples. This is an unpermitted uh, ice cream cart on the right. And uh, this school could easily uh, get permitted as the one on the left. As we can see on the left, uh, the uh, sticker and the permit are posted on the cart. And uh, these type of carts, as we mentioned before, they don't require plan check. All they need to do is submit a request for a evaluation of the cart. The cart on the right could be permitted um, if they require requ request a site evaluation, receive a certification for the sticker, if they have an approved commissary, and they just need to apply for a public health permit. In this case, it's an activity, the storage of the food on the right, it's uncovered and unprotected, it's outside of the cart, it's not part of the cart. On the, on the left, we can see the food is properly stored inside the cart. In this uh, slide, we're uh, seeing a lot of food carts operating like this. Uh, the unapproved activity is to have all this cut fruit on a bed of ice, so especially melons. So fruit carts cannot sell or cut fruit without a hand washing sink. We don't see it here, but there is no hand washing sink on this cart, so they couldn't operate like this um, without a hand hand sink. Um, the they cannot cut fruit without utensil worm washing or spare utensils. And again, if they are selling melons, melons are considered potentially hazardous foods and they need to have mechanical refrigeration. So how can these cards comply? How can you comply if this is your situation? Well, fruit carts uh, could cut and package the fruit at a commissary or remodel the cart. If they have cut melons, they still have to have a mechanical refrigeration for that. But if they don't, um, they could sell, um, they could just have a hand washing sink um, and no um, mechanical refrigeration. They still have to have spare clean utensils if they're gonna cut on the cart. And again, if they have melons, they have to have mechanical refrigeration. We also have seen this, uh, which is on the on the left, uh, hot dog grills on the street, just set up sometimes on wheels. So this cannot be done. Um, they would need, um, they're, they're, they don't have overhead protection. They don't have 
integral equipment, meaning equipment that is part of the cart. So this is not part of a cart. They don't have a hand washing sink and um, they don't have as an option of the um, wear washing sink uh, spare utensils. So how can um, hot dog carts like that comply? We can, they can uh, provide overhead protection. They can provide a cart, an actual cart, and uh, have a spare utensils uh, and keep uh, dirty and clean utensils separate and provide an integral hand washing sink or a sink that is part of the operation. So I think I see some questions. Uh, it's pretty much uh, the end of the presentation almost. So uh, we can go ahead and uh, answer some questions, Cynthia. Okay, terrific. So Tirsa asked in the chat, would you please more clearly define bare utensils? And Lisa just answered, you have to have enough utensils to be able to change out at least every four hours and additional in case they fall or become contaminated. Thank you very much for answering that question. Um, there are no additional questions in the chat and no hands raised, so we may continue uh, with the conclusion of the presentation. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you everyone for standing by uh, and uh, uh, being with us on this presentation. Before we go, also, we want to talk about this uh, food pop-ups that uh, they are not included or addressed on SB 972. Um, I believe our caller earlier was asking about this. And yeah, in effect, they are not included as part of the law. Remember that compact mobile food operations, which are the new mobile food facilities approved under the new law, they require that all the equipment is part of the cart. So it has to be part of the cart. If it's, and in these cases, we, you know, this is just a setup on the street. So uh, these cannot be approved under the new law. They are not contemplated. Um, and just, uh, you know, a food pop-up is comprised typically of a restaurant style equipment, food tables that are all set up under a tent and uh, there is food preparation there. So they are not contemplated on their SB 972, but we uh, think there may be a potential solution for cities or organizations that want to support street vendors, uh, for street vendors to organize themselves or to join uh, establishing community events or joining commu existing community events. We can walk you through the process of doing this. If you call us, this is our community events phone number, 626-430-5230. You can always call us at Community and Industry Engagement and we'll be happy to connect you uh, with somebody that can help you. But these type of uh, setups could be done under a community event. So uh, with that, um, if there are more questions, uh, we can take a couple more questions. I wanna post just our contact information uh, slide here. Cynthia? Thank you. So J.D. Whitaker asked, will this presentation be available to download for future reference? Yes, it would be available to watch. Um, I don't think we have it downloadable, but we would provide it. Uh, the slides themselves, yes, would be available on that PDF format, so you can download them, yes. Terrific. Um, if you are participating via telephone, please press star five to raise or lower your hand, and then we can I can enable your microphone. So you may unmute yourself if you have a question. Yeah, I, I think uh, Lisa just posted a very important resource uh, on the chat, which is if you need uh, funding, there the county has a uh, grant that they are, um, uh, looking for um, applicants that uh, need support uh, on, in terms of uh, consultation, uh, business consultations, and also some uh, funds. So feel free to check that out on the chat. It's opportunity.alecounty.gov. Uh, check it out on the chat. Uh, hopefully you can benefit or find 
if you know somebody that can benefit from that, that's available. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, and I do want to continue to, um, you know, make sure that you do check back with our Department of Economic Opportunity. Um, they have received some funding to support our sidewalk food vendors. And so they are actually working um, to develop some model plans. Um, additionally, they will be working on developing at least 200 carts that will be made available. Um, as far as how that process will work is still being um, developed, but definitely check back with our Department of Economic Opportunity um, as they're working to, of course, um, you know, continue to support sidewalk food vending. Thank, Thank you, Lisa. you very, very much. Uh, we do not have any questions in the chat and there are no hands raised. With that being said, at this point, we will have two quick questions on your screen. Simply go to menti.com and enter the code on the top of the screen, 31748169. Or if you have a smartphone available, please scan the QR code on the screen. It is on the lower left hand side. You can type up to three answers for each of the two questions. Each answer can only be 25 characters long. We appreciate your feedback. If you would like to type a longer question or answer, or want our team to follow up with you, please let us know on the, me on the meeting chat. We will see the anonymous answers as they pop up on the screen. The first question is, what information was most useful? We will give one minute for everyone to answer now. So this would help us to, um, you know, see what type of guidance is needed. Uh, we need to develop if we need to develop any additional guidance. Um, we can um, leave this um, survey open if you want to think about what, what things uh, were most useful for you. And on the next uh, question, uh, you will be able to give us uh, some feedback. Okay, the voting will close at this point. And what information was most useful? We have appreciation, pictures, costs, as well as comparisons. So moving on to the second question. What would you like to know more about? Again, each answer can only be 25 characters long. We will give one minute for everyone to answer this question. And if you'd like to type a longer question or answer or want our team to follow up with you again, please let us know on the meeting chat. Okay, so we're seeing some uh, more about approved cards, enforcement, exact uh, cost, permitted kitchens. We have 20 more seconds. And again, we will leave this survey open for the remainder of the day. So if you want to uh, come back to this, just uh, all you need is the, um, the code. Um, you can just scan the QR code and leave it on your phone and answer it whenever you want. We appreciate your feedback. Yes. And the voting has closed for the time being, but it will remain open the rest of the day. Um, yeah. We see how cottage food may be, approved cards, enforcement, oh, exact cost. Can I just cost. interject there, Cynthia? Sure. 
Yeah, Sarah, I know that we do have a presentation that we have developed for cottage food operators that are interested in learning more about how SB 972 um, does apply to them. So I would definitely recommend that you subscribe so that we can invite you to those presentations. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We also have commissaries, unique situations, uh, impact by new regulations, permitted kitchens and scenarios. And that's what the participants would like to know more about. OK, with that being said, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we will host another webinar in Spanish next Thursday, April 27, 2023 at 10 a.m. Please be on the lookout for another reminder to register and please share with business partners and others interested in operating food carts. Uh, the recording of this meeting and the slide deck will be posted on our website within a couple of weeks. We will let you know when it is posted. Again, feel free to contact our community and industry engagement team at 626-430-5156 for anything related to SB 972. Thank you everyone again for joining us. Director Lisa, would you like to share any final thoughts? No, I just want to thank everybody for participating um, in this webinar. This is the first of many webinars that we'll continue to um, offer. Um, please definitely, you know, we, we hope to get our fees approved on May 23rd. Um, if you look at our website, the fees have definitely been reduced for a lot of our mobile food facilities. Um, so we hope that we can get those um, up and approved and that way we can continue to um, permit food carts at a lower cost. Um, with that, we definitely encourage your feedback. So please make sure that you do send it to our community and industry engagement team. We do want to hear from you um, and definitely know that we're in this together. So if you have any concerns or questions, forward them our way. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.